Did you know that Pixar's Coco is a love letter to Mexican culture, but specifically the Day of the Dead? And the film is alive with details, secrets, and Easter eggs that you absolutely have to see. Near the beginning of the movie, Abuelita is messing with a picture on their family altar, called an ofrenda. Ofrenda in Spanish means offering. Look behind the skeleton on the right, though. Who's that sitting on the jar lid? That's right, Pixar's got you literally finding Nemo. He shows up again on the alebrijes table in the plaza. Dory's there, too. Find her on the table while you're at it. An alebrije, by the way, is a little statue of an imaginary and fantastical creature. This next one isn't just a blink and you'll miss it, it might actually help if you're watching on the screen with blur reduction. Right after the scene at the ofrenda, Abuelita goes crazy forbidding music from everyone everywhere. In one quick shot, Miguel can be seen in a window listening to music from a passing truck. Look sharp, that truck in question should be familiar to any diehard Pixar fan. A run-down yellow pickup with a rocket ship light on top. The Pizza Planet delivery truck from Toy Story. Of course, Nemo and the Pizza Planet truck aren't the only Pixar references in Coco. When Miguel makes his way to Shine Shoes in the plaza, he passes two posts wrapped with piñatas. One of them is even giving a little howdy to make sure you don't miss him. Recognize that, cowboy? How about the Space Ranger that's with him? You just spotted Woody and Buzz Lightyear. But they're not alone. Did you happen to ID that little green one-eyed monster that's with them? Monsters, Inc.'s very own Mike Wazowski. How well do you know your saints? If you've got an ear for details, you might catch this one. When Miguel enters the plaza and sees the statue of Ernesto de la Cruz, his voiceover says, De la Cruz started out as nobody from Santa Cecilia just like me. Santa Cecilia, or Saint Cecilia, is the patron saint of music. Knowing this, maybe Miguel's family would have had more control over him had they moved to a town named after St. John the Silent. Coco has a lot more Easter eggs to find, and these first ones were easy compared to what's coming next. This one's for you real Pixar pros out there. When Miguel tells the story of Ernesto de la Cruz, there's a shot of vinyl records being tossed in a pile. On the corner of one album cover, you'll spot a number, A113. A113 was a room number for graphic design and character animation at the California Institute of the Arts. Many Pixar animators learned their craft there, and the alumni love to sneak that number into projects all the time. In fact, this isn't the only spot in Coco where the number appears. Keep your eyes peeled. When Miguel sneaks off to his hidden ofrenda for Ernesto de la Cruz, he plays his guitar and watches one of de la Cruz's classic films. While Ernesto's character serenades a young lady, there's a close-up of his hands playing a specific guitar lick. Later in The Land of the Dead, listen close as Miguel and Hector chat on the aerial tram. He's obviously out of practice, but as Hector noodles on the guitar, a keen ear will recognize he's trying to play that exact lick. He also tells Miguel that he taught de la Cruz everything he knows. Coco's director Leon Critch is a super fan of director Stanley Kubrick's film version of The Shining. In the shot where Dante the dog is rolling on the ground before climbing onto the roof of the family store, pay close attention to the background on the left. The axe in the stump is modeled after the one swung by Jack Nicholson in the horror classic. Behind the axe is a red drum. Red rum was the iconic word said by the character Danny in the movie. This detail might seem like a stretch, but Uncritch hinted as much in his Twitter account. So there you go, an Easter egg and a dad joke. This next one centers around Miguel's faithful friend and spirit guide dog, Dante. The scene where Dante helps himself to food left from Miguel's ancestors on the ofrenda is an example of art imitating life. On a research trip for the movie, Uncritch witnessed a dog being chased away from an ofrenda for the very same reason and felt it was too good a detail not to put in the movie. There's another detail on the ofrenda that's almost impossible to spot. You'll need to pause and then look really closely to catch this clever bit of foreshadowing. Take a look at the belt buckle in the torn photo. Now take a look at the one worn by Ernesto de la Cruz. Notice anything? They're different. You might think that he was just wearing a different belt buckle for the mariachis. Getting a custom belt buckle is a big deal, a sign that you've really made it. So the fact that Ernesto's is different from the one in the photo is also a pretty big deal for a reveal later in the film. Actor John Ratzenberger's voice is super familiar in the Pixar universe. From Toy Story's Ham to the Abominable Snowman in Monsters, Inc. and Mac in Cars, there's no denying his trademark tenor. Yet there isn't any trace of him in Coco. Or is there? Pay close attention to the skeleton with the sparkling grill leaving the land of the dead. After being told his picture is on the dentist's ofrenda, under a disguised lisp and in the shortest role of his Pixar career, Ratzenberger replies, Gracias. And according to the credits, his character's name is Juan Orthodoncia, or in English, John Orthodontics. 
Remember how A113 is an important number for Pixar? The team found another home for it in the Department of Family Reunions. You might get a warm, fuzzy feeling hearing that, but the punchline is that when Miguel and his ancestors enter the department, that number is imprinted on the door for the Bureau of Family Grievances. And here's another you might have missed. Notice how Hector has a gold tooth on the right side of his mouth, and the headstock of De La Cruz's guitar is a skull with a gold tooth on the left side. It's as if Hector and the guitar are two halves of a whole. And here's something else you might have missed about Hector, too. You might have noticed that Hector looks a little, well, shabby, even for someone in his state. His vest and pants are ripped up, and he doesn't even have shoes. At the end of the movie, though, once he's finally being remembered, his appearance completely changes. His clothes are patched, and he now has shoes, and even his bones are brighter. You could say that escaping the final death has given Hector a new life. Are you quick enough to catch this easter egg? Keeping in mind that director Leon Kirch's super fandom of The Shining, when Miguel chases after Dante and the monkey in Frida Kahlo's studio, have your finger on the pause button. In the background, you'll find an artist's rendition of the terrifying twin sisters who haunt the Overlook Hotel in Kubrick's horror masterpiece. Frida Kahlo's studio is no place for games, unless you're a spirit guide or a Pixar animator. Keep your eye on the ball, the Pixar ball that is, as it can be seen sitting on a table in the background while Dante and Frida's monkey monkey around in the studio. Even in the land of the dead, superhero movies are a big deal. Don't blink or you'll miss an easter egg during the street scene just before the Battle of the Bands. The sparkling Toro could steal your attention away from the wall on the right, where you can catch a glimpse of the Incredibles as skeletons. During the Battle of the Bands competition, one band's drum reads Escapula, which is Latin and Spanish for scapula or shoulder blade. As metal band names go, this one is decidedly 50-50. Blade? Nice. Shoulder? Not so much. Did you spot the t-shirt on the Skrillex-inspired DJ? The skull and black t-shirt are reminiscent of the one worn by everyone's favorite Pixar bully, Sid, from Toy Story. Frida Kahlo isn't the only Mexican historical figure to feature in Coco. Pixar made sure to give props to other important Mexican icons by making them guests at De La Cruz's Fiesta. Ahead of Miguel in line, legendary wrestler El Santo, and 1940s and 50s Mexican film actress Maria Felix are let to the party, but not without a photo op with the security guard. As De La Cruz's party rages on, Miguel and De La Cruz share a sing-along with yet more significant figures of Mexican culture. El Santo and Maria Felix are there, of course, as well as comedy icon Cantinflas, Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata, and two popular singers on which De La Cruz's character is actually based, Pedro Infante and Jorge Negret. Ah, remind me never to accept a drink from those guys. The conductor at the final concert is based on someone too, though it isn't a celebrity like the others. His distinctive blue glasses are the hint as to who he was modeled after. It's actually the film's composer Michael Giacchino, and it looks like he's pulling double duty and is involved with Coco's music both in and out of the movie. The character of Miguel was not always voiced by Anthony Gonzalez. Production went on so long for Coco that the original actor's voice changed and he had to be replaced. However, the original actor's voice can still be heard in the movie. During the climactic chase scene backstage, he's the voice of the stagehand, who tells Ernesto de la Cruz he's going on in 30 seconds. Probably the sweetest touch of all comes after the end credits have rolled. A digital friend, a family and friends who supported and inspired the filmmakers. You may need to get up close to your screen for this one, but among the portraits, see if you can spot Apple CEO Steve Jobs. And legendary comedian Don Rickles, who voiced Mr. Potato Head in the Toy Story movies, is also there. I hope you liked the video and found some things you missed the first time watching Coco. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs.